The first heartbeat, how did it originate? Where did life begin, and why are there so many varieties of animals and people? I'll return in a moment with the amazing facts. Hello, this is Joe Cruz and the Amazing Facts broadcast, facts which affect you. You know, recently I talked to a man with a fantastic amount of faith. Not one shade of doubt crept into his animated description of man's origin and destiny. He was an evolutionist I met on an airplane. With incredible confidence, he bridged the eons of prehistoric time to explain the existence of modern plant and animal life. His detailed description of human ascent from a tiny one-cell monad was so vivid and convincing that one could almost believe he had seen the, microscope, the microscopic amoeba turn into a man. Now, what is this evolution doctrine which inspires so much faith in its followers, friends? How has it turned great scientists into dogmatic opponents of any other viewpoint? Many... Evolutionary scientists have united their professional influence to forbid any classroom instruction contrary to their own views. Does the theory of evolution merit this kind of fanatic support which would silence all opposing ideas? When religious people take such a position, they're called bigots. But scientists seem to escape that charge. In February 1977, almost 200 of the nation's academic community sent letters to school boards across the United States urging that no alternate ideas on origins be permitted in the classrooms except evolution. Now this indicates that the evolutionists are feeling the threat of a rising revolt against the stereotyped contradictory versions of their theory. Many students are looking for honest answers to their questions about the origin and purpose of life. For the first time, the stale traditions of evolution are having to go on the defensive. But let's take a look at what they have to defend. Then you'll understand why these evolutionary scientists are people of such extraordinary faith, and why they're so fearful of facing competition at the school level. How does the evolutionist explain the existence of that first one-celled animal from which all other life forms supposedly evolved? For many years, the medieval idea of spontaneous generation was the accepted explanation. According to Webster, spontaneous generation is, quote, the generation of living from non-living matter. It's taken from a belief now abandoned that organisms found in putrid organic matter arose spontaneously from it. End of statement. Simply stated, then, this simply means that under the proper conditions of temperature, time, place, and so forth, decaying matter simply turned into organic life. Now, this simplistic idea dominated scientific thinking until about 1846, when Louis Pasteur completely shattered the theory by his experiments. He exposed the whole concept as utter foolishness. Under controlled laboratory conditions... In a semi-vacuum, uh, no organic life ever emerged from decaying non-living matter. Reluctantly, it was abandoned as a valid uh, scientific issue. Today, no reputable scientist tries to defend it on a demonstrable basis. That's why Webster said it was now abandoned. It never has been and never can be demonstrated in the test tube. And no present process is observed that could support the idea of spontaneous generation. Obviously, if spontaneous generation actually did take place in the distant past to produce the first spark of life, it must be assumed that the laws which govern life had to be completely different from what they are now. But wait a minute, this won't work either because the whole evolutionary theory rests upon the assumption that conditions on the earth have remained uniform throughout the ages. Do you begin to see the dilemma of the evolutionist in explaining that first amoeba or monad or whatever form the first cell was? If it sprang up spontaneously from no previous life, it contradicts a basic law of nature which forms the foundation of the entire theory. Yet without believing in spontaneous generation, the evolutionist would have to acknowledge other than natural forces at work. In other words, God. Now how do they get around this dilemma? Well, Dr. George Wald, Nobel Prize winner of Harvard University, states it as cryptically and honestly as an evolutionist can. 
In his uh, article in Scientific American of August 1954, he said this, One has only to contemplate the magnitude of this task to concede that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. Yet here we are, as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. End of quotation. Now that statement by Dr. Wall demonstrates a much greater faith than a religious creationist can muster. Notice that the great evolutionary scientist says it couldn't have happened. It was impossible. Yet he believes it did happen. Now what can we say to that kind of faith? At least the creationist believes that God was able to speak life into existence. His is not a blind faith in something that he concedes to be impossible. So here we are, face to face with the first contradiction of evolution with the basic law of science. In order to sustain his humanistic explanation of the origin of life, he must accept the exploded unscientific theory of spontaneous generation. And the big question is this, why is he so violently opposed to the spontaneous generation spoken of in the Bible? A miracle of creation is required in either case. Either God did it by divine fiat, or blind, unintelligent nature produce Wall's impossible act. Let any reasonable mind contemplate the alternatives for a moment. Doesn't it take more faith to believe that chance could produce life easier than infinite intelligence could produce it? Why did Dr. Wall say it was impossible for life to result from spontaneous generation? And by the way, that was not an easy concession for a confirmed evolutionist to make. His exhaustive research for a scientific explanation ended in failure, as it has for all other evolutionary scientists, and he had the courage to admit it. But he also had an incredible faith to believe in it, even though it was a scientific impossibility. A Christian who confessed to such a faith would be labeled as naive and gullible. What a difference the cloak of higher education makes on our easily impressed minds. How much simpler and sweeter the faith which simply accepts the inspired account, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now what would be involved in the accidental development of a single living cell, friends? The fact is that the most elementary form of life is much more complicated than any man-made thing on earth. The entire complex of New York City is less compl complicated than the makeup of the simplest microscopic cell. Did you know that? It's more than ridiculous to talk about its chance production. Scientists themselves assure us that the structure of a single cell is unbelievably intricate. The chance for a proper combination of molecules into amino acids and then into proteins for the properties of life is entirely unrealistic. The American Scientist magazine made this admission in January 1955, quote, from the probability standpoint, the ordering of the present environment into a single amino acid molecule would be utterly improbable in all the time and space available for the origin of terrestrial life. Now that's quite a confession, too. A Swiss mathematician, Charles Eugene Gouillet, actually computes the odds against such an occurrence at only one chance in ten to 16 times. That means 10 multiplied by itself 160 times, a number too large even to articulate. Another scientist expressed it this way, quote, the amount of matter to be shaken together to produce a single molecule of protein would be millions of times greater than that in the whole universe. For it to occur on earth alone would require many, almost endless billions of years. And that's taken from the book, the, in, the Evidence of God in an Expanding Universe, page 23. So how can we explain, then, the naive insistence of evolutionists to believe something so extremely out of character for their scientific background? And how can we harmonize and the normal, broad-minded tolerance of the educated with the narrow bigotry exhibited by many evolutionary scientists in trying to suppress opposing viewpoints? The obvious explanation would seem to be rooted in the desperation of such evolutionists to retain their reputation as the sole dispensers of dogmatic truth. To acknowledge a superior wisdom would shatter the egocentric image that has been too long cultivated by the evolutionist community. They've repeated their assumptions for so long and supported their theories that they've started accepting them as facts. Now, nobody objects to their assuming whatever they want to assume, but to assume happenings that go contrary to all scientific evidence and still call it science is being dishonest. 
Now let's look at a second basic evolutionary teaching, which is contrary to scientific law. One of the most necessary parts of evolution, which is supposed to provide the power for changing the amoeba into a man, is mutation. Now this refers to abnormal changes in the organism, which is assumed to be caused by chemical changes in the genes themselves. The genes are the hereditary factors within the chromosomes of each species. The assumption is that these genes, which provide the inherited characteristics we get from ancestors, occasionally become affected by unusual pairing, chemical damage, or other influences which cause them to produce an unusual change in one of the offspring. And this is referred to as a mutation. Through gradual changes wrought in the various species through mutation, it's assumed by the evolutionists that the amoeba turns into an invertebrate, which becomes an amphibian, and then a reptile, and a quadruped, and then an ape form, and finally a man. In other words, the species are not fixed in the eyes of the evolutionist. Families are forever drifting over into another higher form as time progresses. This means that all the fossil records of animal history should reveal an utter absence of precise family boundaries. Everything should be in the process of changing into something else, with literally hundreds of millions of half-developed fish trying to become amphibious, and reptiles halfway transformed into birds, and mammals looking like half-apes are man. Now, everybody knows that instead of finding those billions of confused family fossils, the scientists have found exactly the opposite. Not one single drifting, changing life form has been located in all the years that fossils have been studied. Everything stays within the well-defined limits of its own basic kind and absolutely refuses to cooperate with the demands of modern evolutionists. Now, most people, I think, would give up and change their theory when faced with such a crushing, deflating blow, but not the evolutionist. He still searches for that elusive missing link which could at least prove that he hasn't been 100% wrong. But let's look at the vehicle which the evolutionists have depended on to provide the possibility of these drastic changes required by their theory. Sir Julian Huxley, a principal spokesman for evolution, said this, Mutation provides the raw material of evolution. Again, he said, Mutation is the ultimate source of all her uh, heritable variation. That's in his book, Evolution in Action, page 38. Professor Ernest Meyer, another leader of the evolution, said this, Yes, it must not be forgotten that mutation is the ultimate source of all genetic variation found in natural populations and the only raw material available for natural selection to work on. Now, please keep this in mind clearly. Evolutionists say that mutation is absolutely essential to provide the upgrading of species, which change the simple forms into more complex forms. But... The scientific fact is that mutation could never accomplish what evolution demands of it for several reasons. As all scientists agree, mutations are very rare. Huxley guesses that only about one in a hundred thousand is a mutant. And second, when they do occur, they're almost certain to be harmful and deadly rather than making it better. And now, this is Joe Cruz saying goodbye for today.